Hey, welcome to the shop. Almost every welding project or metalworking project requires cutting metal, and the tool that you choose to use will have a major effect on the quality of your part and especially on how long it takes to make it. And so I'm gonna go over 10 different options that are available, not any one brand or anything like that, just 10 different types of cutting tools that you might wanna think about uh, when you're setting up your metalworking shop or if you're looking to uh, take it to the next level. So I'll give you my take on those. And there's others available beyond those, so if you have some other favorites, go ahead and let us know in the comments below. The first one is the most basic, and it's a hacksaw. And you might be wondering, well, if I've got all these uh, powered tools, what would I want with a hacksaw? Well, I don't get it out too often, because honestly, it's just a lot of work, and it takes a long time. But there are times when I want to make just a small little cut, or I want to cut something off flush, that I will pull this out. So, you know, don't overlook the most simple one right here, the hacksaw. Now let's get into the power tools. Next up is the angle grinder. If I were to recommend the first metalworking tool to buy, it would be an angle grinder because they're good for almost anything. You can get them as cheap as right around $10, $15 uh, for a really cheap one. For, you know, $40 or $50, you can get a pretty decent one. Um, so I, I really like to, to have an angle grinder around. Now there's a couple different types of wheels that you can put on to use them for cutting. And uh, the two that uh, I, I'm aware of anyway are the standard abrasive um, black wheel and then this right here is a diamond wheel. It's similar to a tile wheel, but this one's made for metal. Now, these both work uh, really well to make cuts. You know, my preference is still the black wheels because they cut faster than the diamond wheels and they're not quite as loud. But at the same time, these diamond wheels last a really, really long time and they don't wear down. One of the hard parts with the black wheels is they'll wear down and then the diameter gets smaller and smaller and you're trying to just get in there and squeeze the last bit of life out, but it's tough. I, I think that this is a, a really good tool now. Uh, you do end up with a little bit of heat on your material and also a little bit of a burr on the edge when you cut with the uh, cutoff wheel here. And how straight you get it is really going to depend completely on your skill because it's a hand guided tool. So this is my abrasive chop saw and this is not a really nice one. This is one that's about 20 years old. It's a Harbor Freight one. I've cut a fair bit of metal uh, with it and it, it works pretty well. I've upgraded to a different type of saw that I'll show you in a minute. But um, an abrasive chop saw's real advantage is um, how quickly you can cut nice square material without uh, breaking the bank on the cost. I mean, they're really pretty affordable. I don't know the exact dollar amounts now, but uh, you know, the cost is not too bad. And I think Harbor Freight makes a nicer saw than this one that they sell today. And you can get them at you know, pretty much any hardware store online. I'll, I'll try to link a couple examples down in the description. But nice for that. Now when you cut through, your material is going to be hot as you can imagine from all these sparks coming off of here. And it does leave a burr that you have to clean up on the edge. So that's something to be aware of with it. So um, I don't really like them because they're uh, you know, loud, there's a lot of sparks and there's that burr to clean off. So, so I think there's other better options, but I used it for a long time and for the money, I mean, you can make a lot of really good stuff with an abrasive chop saw. Now, one thing to keep in mind is these black blades here are not usually suited very well for cutting aluminum. Uh, and some of the tooth blade saws that we'll look at in a minute might be a little better for that. Next up are these bladed saws, or sometimes they're called dry cut saws. Now I have two different sizes of them. The first one I got is this little seven inch uh, saw right here. It's a Trajan uh, Q700, I guess is the brand. There's other brands of them out there. Uh, I don't really have a horse in the race here as far as which one you choose, but this one works really well. Um, I like it. It's good if you're going to be cutting material like two inches. It works really well. The thing's really kind of a, a beast powering through that for its size. And I like it just because of its portability, right? You can just grab it, throw it in the truck, throw it on the back of the trailer and just cut material as it comes off. Really portable. So, so it's nice for that, but it is limited on the size of material that you can uh, cut. But I liked cutting with the toothed blade here. Uh, so much better that I also picked up a, a bigger version of this. This one is an Evolution is the brand. It, it just works really well. Some of the things I like about it is when I cut through, I can put my finger right on it. I mean, it doesn't heat up hardly at all. 
Uh, it gives a nice, clean, straight cut with almost no burr. So I, I guess, spoiler alert, th this kind of chops out with a tooth blade it is my favorite tool for uh, cutting tubing to length and getting it to fit really well without a lot of messing around. Some of the drawbacks to it, right? Not everything is perfect on it. Uh, one, it's pretty loud. And two, the chips that come off of it are really a mess. They fly kind of a, a long ways and, and they're just this awkward shaped chip that uh, tends to get into everything. So, so that's really, th th those are the main complaints about it. But even still, uh, considering that by far my favorite tool for, for cutting tubing to length. Now you might be wondering, why don't you just buy one of those toothed blades and put it on the less expensive abrasive chop saw that we looked at? Well, part of the reason that these cost a little bit more is they're set up, I think they have a gearbox inside, but the blade spins at about half the speed on these. And so they have to have the, um, equipment to be able to do that uh, built into it. So that's that's one of the things that uh, you know you, you need to keep an eye out for if you're looking at changing up different types of blades is make sure that it operates at the proper speed um, to be able to work uh, in your in your case. And also these can be changed. There's a, a fence on here and it can be pivoted around to cut 45 degree angles on things. Um, and you can make a bunch of different kinds of cuts with that. Next up is the portable bandsaw. Now these are really, really nice because you can cut through just some beefy stuff with them and they give a really nice edge. Now I have two in my shop, one's this Milwaukee and one is a DeWalt. I did a shootout or a comparison video of three different brands. I did the Milwaukee and DeWalt that I have and I borrowed a buddy's Bauer from Harbor Freight. Uh, in another video, I'll link down in the description below. But uh, anyway, they all worked really well. Some of these are a little pricey, the, you know, the Milwaukee and DeWalt are, but the price that you can pick up like one of those Harbor Freight ones, I think that's not a bad tool to follow on after you have an angle grinder for your next cutting tool. It's just really portable and you can adapt it into the next type of tool that I'm gonna show you in a minute. Okay, next up is a vertical bandsaw. Now, traditionally vertical bandsaws were large pieces of equipment with huge bands on them, and that's uh, you know just not practical for someone like me who's building out a little shop in the back uh, corner of my garage. And so I, I was really excited to get a table here that I can mount one of these portable bandsaws in. So, so this is one that I purchased. It's from Swag Off Road uh, and I'm pretty happy with it. I did a review video, I, I don't know, a year or so ago on this uh, particular table. If you want to check that out, I'll link it in the description. But um, basically you can use a vertical bandsaw either to cut stock and material or to cut out little notches. Uh, it's just really easy and controllable. And right here, this one, I have a miter gauge um, or, or this little sliding bar here that I can put my material on to help keep it square and straight. And, and it just makes it uh, a little easier to guide your workpiece in the way that you want it to go. So it's handy for a whole lot of things. I find this as a definite go-to uh, item in the shop. And the cool part about it is I can just unscrew this portable band off of here and use it as a regular portable bandsaw or take it with me if I need to cut something and then set it up here in the stand. So I, I might look at doing that, you know, after you get a portable bandsaw at some point. And I've seen a lot of people build their own stands. Either way, vertical bandsaw is a, is a really handy tool uh, to have around. And that, that's kind of the types of things. It's good for cutting flat stock or cutting notches out of tubing. I've used it for that quite a bit too. Now, while we're talking about uh, bandsaws, let's talk about horizontal bandsaws. Now, a horizontal bandsaw is basically like that portable bandsaw, but it can open and close and pivot like this. So it's kind of a combination of the chop saw we looked at earlier and a bandsaw. Now, some of the things that I really like about a bandsaw like this, one, these tooth blades, they work great for just cutting you know, steel or aluminum uh, or, or just about whatever you throw at them, as long as you get the right tooth count on the blade. Um, another thing I like about them is they're quiet. They're a lot quieter than a chop saw. But on the other hand, they're quite a bit slower than a chop saw, so it takes a while to actually get through the material. But you end up with a cut that's relatively clean without a lot of burrs on it that you have to clean off after. So um, it's really good from that perspective, you know, and, and I've seen people before build, I, I've got a buddy down the street who uh, just built a stand for his portable bandsaw to turn it into a horizontal bandsaw, which, you know, I thought that's a really good idea and that, that turned out really well. 
Um, but uh, anyway, it works pretty good. This one uh, is a Wen brand. It, it's maybe not the, you know, it was the cheapest one that I could find at the time. Uh, picked it up off Amazon. I've cut a lot of good material with it. If I have one complaint about it, it seems like, and I don't know that it's my particular model of saw, this type of saw in general, but to get a straight cut, right, this, this blade can wander off one side or the other. You need one to have a blade that's in good condition is really important. And then you have to square up these guides and get everything just right. So it takes a bit of fussing around. When I get it set up just right, I mean, I can get square cut after square cut, you know, one after another, uh, really good. As long as I don't bear into it, right, I'm, I'm fairly gentle with it. But it does take a little messing around to get it set up and, and cutting square like that, where like the, that, uh, those chop saws, they're basically cutting square right out of the gate. So uh, they're really good for that. Now higher end uh, band saws are, are larger. Usually they have their own stand integrated. And if you go up a couple of levels from this, you'll have something that will flow coolant over the blade itself. And that helps the whole process out. It helps to keep chips from getting stuck in. So it's really a much better arrangement. But for me, I'm excited to even be able to have a band saw in the shop because having something uh, on a large stand just isn't practical for the space that I have. So I like, you know, this kind of tool that I can tuck away and then pull out when I need to use it. And, and I've cut a lot of material with it. You know, it's, uh, it's definitely been, been a good staple in the shop and, and I'm happy to have it around as an option. Okay, so the types of cutting that we've looked at so far have been either abrasive cutting, like with the abrasive chop saw, or the wheels on an angle grinder and the rest have been saw cutting so those mechanical cutting methods uh, really all work pretty well and and they have their place right whether you want portability or uh, whether you want more power or stability um, there, there's just a lot of options there and you really don't need all of them but uh, let's talk about some thermal cutting methods now so this is my cutting torch right here and you can see it looks almost like brand new even though I've had it for many years because I basically never use it. But for some people, this is the perfect fit for the job. So if you're gonna use a cutting torch a lot, I definitely recommend having larger cylinders than this. So my grandpa had a shop up in rural Idaho and he would build wood stoves using a cutting torch and a little buzz box welder. And my dad in his auto repair shop, I mean, his oxygen and acetylene tanks and uh, his cutting torch, or he'd use it for heating with a, a different type of uh, heating tip on that uh, a lot of people refer to as a rosebud. Like those were really common tools used in those shops. And, and a lot of people who are working steel and iron, it'll work really well because the thing is, you can cut through plate that's inches thick with a torch like this. Now you need a little bit bigger cylinders, but this torch will do it, um, cutting through that uh, massive thick plate with equipment that doesn't cost a lot and is really quite portable. So it, it definitely has its place. Now I uh, haven't been cutting much with it in the recent past and the cut quality you get is gonna depend a lot on your skill and just how steady you are. But let me tell you, someone who's got a really steady hand with it and has practiced with the torch, and get such a beautiful clean edge cut with that. So it's definitely capable. You can see here, uh, I didn't get that good of a result uh, in my case, but uh, that's a little bit from being out of practice and it's still not too bad um, either way. Anyway, so it's really good for portability. It's good that you can cut through thick steel with it and uh, just handy. Now, if you do decide to go down this road, there's a whole bunch of safety stuff to understand about how using one of these properly, the order that you turn the valves on and off and everything like that um, make, makes a big difference. So definitely be sure to learn all of the, the safety procedures when it comes to this one. Now, one of the reasons I haven't used the torch much is not too long after I got that, I got this plasma cutter. This is a Hypertherm PowerMax 30, and I've been super happy with it. This uh, model's been re replaced with a, an updated version, uh, the PowerMax 30 XP. But anyway, uh, plasma cutter has a torch that you hold like this with a trigger, and you connect the power supply uh, to electricity and to an air compressor, and then you can go, just pull the trigger, and it shoots this hot jet of air with an arc out 
uh, onto your part and you can cut through pretty thick material. I mean, this right here, uh, I can cut through 3 8 inch thick plate. I could probably sever half inch and this is a small unit. This is the smallest one they sell. Um, and this one will run off 120 or 240 volts. So uh, it, it's really flexible where you can use it, but you do have to have a pretty good uh, air compressor, right? Something that'll put out some air to be able to use it. Now there are some versions that have a built-in air compressor that you can pick up, so that can be handy if you uh, don't have the air supply with you. So anyway, I, I really like the plasma cutter. I can use a guide and get a nice clean, straight cut with it. It's handy for all sorts of things and you don't have to refill a bunch of cylinders. Um, but you do have to make sure you have the electrical supply that'll be able to run it and the air supply for it. And then uh, another little tip when it comes to these is just make sure to keep the, the electrodes and nozzles, all these things in the end they call consumables because they get used up. Keep those in good condition. So replace them when necessary and you'll continue to get a really nice cut for years out of something like this. So I reach for this instead of the cutting torch almost all the time. The other nice thing about this is you can cut through aluminum as well. So uh, it'll, it'll cut through you know, steel, stainless steel, aluminum, pretty much anything that conducts electricity, um, this thing can cut. So uh, definitely one of the staples in the shop and one of my very favorite tools. Now the last tool that I'll talk about is a CNC plasma cutting table. So it's similar to that plasma cutter before, but this is my plasma table here and uh, it's my second table. I, I have two here in the, the shop. They're kind of my bigger items. The first one that I built folds up so it doesn't take up, it takes up almost no room when I'm not using it. And I'll, I'll do a video about that coming up here. Um, but, but this is my larger table here and uh, you can see that it just automates the whole process. So it has motors that move the torch around to get the right cut. Now some of the things that are, uh, you know, really nice about it is you can get repeatable parts. They come out the same every time. Um, some of the drawbacks is obviously these are, you know, pretty expensive to get up front and they take a bit of uh, learning and know-how to get them to work right because you need to create the geometry in the computer in CAD and then turn that into a tool path and send it out to the plasma cutter itself. Now some companies have made that whole process a lot simpler uh, than, than others, but there still is a little bit of, of learning to do. Um, but, you know, just to be aware that it is an option, right? As uh, your shop grows and you want to make more of these unique or custom sized parts, you can do it with a table like this. Now, I'm going to throw in one bonus here. I know we've gone over our 10, but uh, the last one, if you don't have a plasma cutting table like that, or you don't have a desire to have one, you can actually send out and have parts cut for you. Um, one service that I've used a lot is called Send Cut Send, but I've seen others advertised out there and I've also used local shops. So you can create your drawing and upload it to, you know, one of these online services. I like Send Cut Send because their minimum cost is pretty low, so you can order just a few parts and it doesn't cost you a lot. And uh, just upload your drawing on the website. They give you a quote right there and you click order and it's almost like you're buying it off of Amazon. It just comes in the mail in a few days. Hopefully this helped you understand what kind of cutting tools are available out there and what uh, might work for you in your shop. And uh, if you like this, you want to learn more about welding and fabrication, go ahead and click that subscribe button below and we'll see you next time.